Welcome to our review on evidence for evolution. So the first thing we need to do is go back to our key stage three knowledge and the fact that when we're talking about a fossil, what we're referring to are the remains of animals or plants that have become mineralized. So they've been changed into rocks. And this is something that's happened over a really long period of time. Now, what we actually find is that the deeper underground you go, the older the fossils get. So any fossils we find close to the surface, then they formed in the recent past. Whereas if we're digging deeper into the ground, those ones were formed much longer ago. Now, what we can actually do is when we actually find these fossils at all the different layers within the earth, then what we find is we can build up a sequence showing how these organisms have changed over time. And this is what we're talking about when we refer to this thing called the fossil record. So the fossil record is this key piece of evidence for evolution that we've got, because what we've done is we've dug up all these different fossils of different organisms. We know when they were from and we can see those little tiny changes that have taken place throughout the actual evolution of that organism. So if we actually take a look at some of the oldest rocks, then inside there we only find fossilized bacteria. Whereas in more recent rocks, we've got fossils of more complex organisms. So this suggests that life on Earth actually all evolved from these single cell bacteria at some point in the distant past. We also notice the fact that plant fossils actually occur before animal fossils. So this tells us that before animals could evolve, we needed plants. And that obviously links into the fact that plants produce the oxygen, which the animals then need to breathe. The other bit of evidence that we get is that these fossils that we find show that we actually have closely related organisms that have come from the same ancestor. So this is where the whole idea of monkeys and humans coming from the same ancestor have actually originated. Because when we look at the fossil record, we can see that they tie together at some point in the distant past. Now, one of the best examples of a fossil record that we've got is that for the horse. So what we can actually see is that over 60 million years, we've got all the different stages in the evolution of our horse. So you can go right back 60 million years ago to the Eohippus, which was a grand total of a 20 centimetre high horse, so little pocket horses. And then you can see that as we go through time, so moving closer and closer to the present day, the horses are getting bigger. And if you look at their feet, which I've shown you in the middle there, they're also going from these four toes down to three toes until finally we end up with just the single hoof that we know in our horse of today. So this gives us the complete actual record of how a horse has come to be as it is today. If we actually want to study evolution in a lab setting, then there are a couple of organisms that are really useful to us. So bacteria and the Atlantic tomcod are actually really useful because they've got very fast reproductive rates. So that that means that we can see how these features are being passed on in a much shorter time frame than we would with, say, a cat or a dog. Now, another source of evidence that we've got for evolution comes through the molecular comparison of DNA and proteins between different organisms. And what we actually find as a result of this is that if we've got two closely related species, then their DNA and proteins are the most similar to one another. So at the bottom there, we've actually got four different organisms. So the chimpanzee on the right, if we look at one particular protein, it's identical to ours in humans. The rhesus monkey on the far left has one amino acid different. The rabbit actually has nine different amino acids in this one protein and the cow 10 amino acids different. So we can see that we're far more closely related to the chimpanzee than we are to any of the others. But the rhesus monkey isn't far behind. So we can then build up almost a giant family tree of everything on the planet. But one thing we do know is that not all species will actually be able to adapt to their environment as it changes. And in the eventuality that their environment changes beyond the point that they can actually cope with it, then they will become extinct. So they die off. And the sad fact is that 99 percent of all species to have ever lived on planet Earth are now extinct. And around the edge there, you can just see some of the species that no longer exist on our planet, everything from the woolly mammoth to the Tasmanian tiger there with its giant jaws. 
So when animals or plants can no longer cope with the actual environmental conditions, then they will be at risk of becoming extinct. One thing that we can do as humans to preserve biodiversity and hopefully give us a way back should anything catastrophic happen on the planet is we actually have these things called seed banks. Now the picture at the bottom there is of the seed bank up in Svalbard in Norway and basically in there that's buried right the way down in the actual ice so deep deep underground in the very solid ice there because it's freezing cold. Now that means that those seeds are going to be preserved and in there what they've actually got are thousands upon thousands of seeds of all these different plants from all around the world so that should something catastrophic happen on the planet then they can actually go back to the seed bank and get those seeds back. So even if the plants in their existence on the planet surface have all gone, we've got a way to then bring them back through the use of these seed banks.